This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Free monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and healthful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944-8344. That's 944-8344. Or visit our website at www.vsh.org. vsh.org. Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to our monthly meeting of the Vegetarian Society. I'm Bonnie Hilton's replacement. Bonnie Hilton was Alita Rutchik's replacement, our president, who's away just now, and she'll be resuming her duties next month. So I'm a replacement of a replacement of... I can go on. <laughs> I can think of another reason. I can, think, I can go through another, another level of that. So this organization is education. The purpose of this education is to teach people the benefits of vegetarianism. We have no other purpose besides teaching people about vegetarianism. And so we really have no special need to get together and talk to each other. And it's for new people, first timers, people who'd like to learn more about vegetarianism, that we have this organization and have these meetings. I'm looking at our speaker for tonight. He's looking at me through a monocular. Our speaker tonight is Dr. Harris, Dr. William Harris, MD. He's medical director of the Kaiser Permanente Vegan Lifestyle Clinic, an, an, a venture that he began a little less than two years ago, I think, that operates out of the Kaiser Hospital on Pensacola Street. He's been a leader in the Vegetarian Society since its inception. He's been a vegetarian for 48 years and has been a vegan for 35 of those years, the last 35 of those years. He tapes most of these lectures for presentation on Olelo, and that shows on Channel 52 on Thursdays. This is an incredible service that he does and is doing right now all by himself taping vegetarian lectures here or in his lifestyle clinic, editing them, and seeing that they get onto Olelo for presentation to whoever wants to watch them in Honolulu. It's an incredible and solitary and wonderful contribution that he makes to the health of this city and these islands. He tells me that his lecture is going to be short, so there'll be lots of time for questions from the audience. And knowing Bill, I'll bet that there's no special problem with questions during his talk, because his approach to presenting a lecture is to have a conversation. So that's it. If he can be replaced doing what he's doing, his title tonight is All You Ever Wanted to Know About Food But Were Afraid to Ask. Dr. Bill. Carl called me up and asked me if I would take five minutes and tell you everything I know. Basically what I'm going to do is go over the little green pamphlet which I give out to all members or all new patients in the Vegetarian Lifestyle Clinic at Kaiser. So do you all have one of these? This is de rigueur. If you don't have one, you won't understand anything I'm talking about. What I'm going to try to do is walk you through this briefly and explain why it is that I give the advice that I do at the Vegan Lifestyle Clinic. So let's start with page one. Page one is called Getting Started. The ba basic message here is that there's no reason not to be vegan because all of the essential nutrients that are required in the human diet are synthesized either by plants or microorganisms. None of the essential organic nutrients are manufactured by animals. So when you eat animals, you're just getting essential nutrients secondhand. The only thing that you get firsthand from the animal is stuff that you don't want, like saturated fat and cholesterol, which will plug your pipes. I don't know how the human race ever got on the, on the tack of eating animal food because we are the descendants of large arboreal vegetarian primates. Somewhere between the time we were 
frolicking around in the trees and the time we came back down on the plains in Central Africa, we became scavengers. We started using animal food because it was an adaptive mechanism. After all, it's better to eat animals than to eat nothing. But there really isn't any need to continue eating animals now. And Carl already mentioned some of the support services that the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii furnishes. We have all of these books that I've listed on the first page. We have the meetings, and we have the Vegetarian Public Access TV show. Ruth Heydrich has a radio show on Sunday evenings, and all of this information is down at the bottom of the page. Let's turn over to page two. If you look at page two and three, there's about half a dozen recipes here. The one thing that I would like you to try to understand tonight is that if you center your diet on fresh vegetables and fill in your calorie requirements with starches and grains, you'll automatically meet your nutrient requirements. So let's turn to page five. The nutrient analysis table shows the nutrient values of all of the recipes that you saw on page two and three. So let's get started by asking for the definition of RDA. Does everybody see RDA there? Anybody want to make a guess on what RDA means? Recommended daily allowance. What percent of your daily calories should come from carbohydrate? Look under the RDA column. Anyone want to say? 60 to 80 percent, good. And what percent should be fat? 10 to 20. The powers that be say that if you can get your fat content down to 30 percent, well, you're doing pretty well. The average American consumes 38 percent of calories from fat. Protein, what percent should, of calories should come from protein? Okay, now how many people have heard the story that on a vegetarian diet, you're not going to get enough protein? <laughs> Everybody that's ever heard that story put up their hand, okay? That was the first thing I heard in 1950 when I became a vegetarian. That happened to be the same year I won the Big Ten Trampoline Championship, so I didn't take it too seriously. I want you to look at the row entitled protein and look across at those numbers and find me a single number that goes below 10%. If you ate nothing but the chop suey, the, the pea snack, that's perfect snack, the pink palace sandwich, the sassy salsa sandwich, the tacos, and the V4 juice, just variable amounts of those foods, and you could decide for yourself how much of each one you wanted to eat. If those were the only things you ate during that entire day, what percent of calories do you think you would get from protein? Just so you get the numbers there. If anybody had a calculator, we could... 19%. Yeah, somewhere probably between 15 19%. And you only need 10%. And 10% is probably twice as much as you need. So obviously, if you just ate these foods in variable amounts, any amount, you could decide for yourself how much of each one of these recipes you wanted to eat, you would automatically meet your protein requirements. Now let's look down to calcium. What's the RDA for calcium? 800 what? 800 milligrams per day. That's the recommended daily allowance for calcium. Now look across the calcium row and find me a single recipe that drops below 100% of the RDA. There is one that is only 100%. That's the sassy salsa sandwich. Everybody see the V4 juice is up at 368% of the RDA. And the first one, the chop suey, is 158%. So 158% of 800 milligrams would be what, approximately? 1200. About 1,200 milligrams a day. So if you ate nothing but chop suey, you'd get 1,200 milligrams of calcium in a day. And if you ate variable amounts of all those other recipes, you would get well over 100% of your RDA, well over 800 milligrams. You'd probably be around 1,000, maybe 1,100 milligrams. So does everybody get the idea here now? I'm, I've just given you two examples. I've given you protein, and I've given you calcium, and you can see that you're gonna meet the RDAs for both of those things. Now let's go down one more. How much cholesterol are you gonna get on this? kind of a diet. This is a vegan diet now. Oh, zip. zip. There's zip cholesterol in this. All of the, 
all these vegan recipes have zero cholesterol. Plenty of fiber, the RDA for fiber is 22 grams per day and you're up in the 200, 400% range on fiber. So you can go down all the rest of those nutrients and you can see that automatically you're going to meet all of your nutrient requirements for all but one thing. Anybody want to guess what the one thing is that you might be short on on a vegan diet? Vitamin B12. Let's not say that this is an exception to what I said originally that all of the essential nutrients are manufactured by plants and microorganisms. Uh, just because you can't get vitamin B12 in a vegan diet it's only because higher plants don't make it. But the, the reason you get B12 when you eat animal food is because there are bacteria in the animal's gut which do manufacture B12 and the B12 is absorbed into the animal, stored in the liver, stored in various other tissues. And when you eat that animal or you drink the animal's milk, you get that vitamin B12. But the animal did not make that vitamin B12. It's made by the bacteria. Bacteria are the only source of vitamin B12. Most of these recipes have got more than enough vitamin B12 because I played a trick. There's a substance called Red Star T6635 plus nutritional yeast. This stuff has got vitamin B12 added to it and so I put a little vitamin B12 in most of those recipes. The only one that didn't have B12 added was one that Dick Allgaier, the TV caster, made and he didn't put any Red Star on that. Over on the right of this nutrient analysis table, carefully segregated from the rest of the recipes, is a typical fast food recipe. If you can look on the top of page four, the typical fast food meal is one cheeseburger, one milkshake, and one order of french fries. What percent of calories come from fat on that one? Too much, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That for sure, 29% of calories come from fat. It's got 14% of calories from protein, but we did better with chop suey at 19%. The perfect snack had 26%. So, you know, the fast food doesn't have all that much protein, and that's the stuff that it's supposed to have lots of. It's got enough calcium, it's got 230% of the RDA, 230% of 800 milligrams, which would be around 17 or 1800 milligrams, I guess. It has an absolute amount of cholesterol in the amount of 245 milligrams, and the upper limit RDA for cholesterol is 300 milligrams. And that, folks, is put there simply because Congress does not know how to deal with the meat industry. If they had any guts, they would come out and say the upper limit for cholesterol is zero. You do not need cholesterol in your diet. You do need cholesterol in your body. Cholesterol is a major building block in all the cell membranes in your body. It adds structural strength to the cell membranes and it's also the precursor for all of the sterile hormones. So you have to have cholesterol and that's why your own body manufactures 500 milligrams of cholesterol every day. Now the average American eats another 500 milligrams of cholesterol and that's a grand total of 1,000 milligrams of cholesterol per day and it's not surprising that the extra cholesterol that you didn't need to eat in the first place winds up plugging your pipes. We have a, an epidemic of cardiovascular disease in this country that would vanish within a generation at the most if people would stop gnawing on bones. We do not need animal food in our diet. If we cut out the cholesterol in the animal food, we'd see a drastic reduction in cardiovascular disease. What else has that fast food recipe got to offer you? Well, it's got 30% of the RDA for fiber, so you're way under the requirements for fiber, and that, of course, is due to the fact that fiber is not made by any animal. It's only got 68% of the RDA for folate, 96% for iron. How many people have heard that vegetarians are all gonna be anemic, too, because they don't get enough iron? Put up your hands if, you, if you've ever heard the anemia shtick. That's another one. It turns out now that you don't really want to get too much iron because there's literature showing that too much iron may actually predispose to cardiovascular disease and to heart attack. So I would say that we're in kind of a transitional period. Scientifically, we, we hear some 
people still worrying about the possibility that vegetarians won't get enough iron. We've got, on the other hand, a gang of researchers saying, hey, look, that's a good thing. You don't want to have too much iron. And I suppose somewhere in the middle of the next century, we'll finally figure out what the real scoop is on iron. But in the meantime, you should understand that none of the essential minerals in the human diet were synthesized either by animals or by plants. They are the result of nuclear fusion processes that took place inside stars that blew up at least five billion years ago. The animals didn't make them and the plants didn't make them either and you don't have to eat animals just to get your iron. Well you can run down the list there and you can see that if you eat stuff that is more or less in the form of these rather simple recipes here, you're automatically going to get your recommended dietary allowance for all the nutrients that you need. You're not going to get any cholesterol, you're not going to get very much saturated fat. You may have a little trouble get, getting used to eating this kind of food, but once you catch on to it, it's pretty simple. How many people have seen the Food Guide Pyramid? I presume you've all seen that. And I've got it there on the top of that page, but I don't like the top of it, so I chopped it off. I amputated the food guide pyramid, and we cut off the apex because there's nothing in the apex except refined sugar and oil, and I don't think much of dairy products. They haven't got anything that's magical about them in spite of the massive ad campaigns that have gone on, the milk mustaches and related tomfoolery, and of course meat is out. So the top of the food guide pyramid goes away. Where we wind up down the bottom is a slightly revised trapezoid because I don't think that the grains and starches belong down on the base of that pyramid either. I don't think they should be the first thing you think of when you think of good nutrition. It should be the vegetables and the fruit. Right next to the food guide trapezoid in bold face my recommendation, base your diet on fresh vegetables and fill in your calorie needs with fresh fruit, starches, and grains. And if you do that, you're virtually guaranteed to get all of the essential nutrients that you need. You won't be getting cholesterol and saturated fat, and you'll probably start to feel better if you're not feeling well now. On page 7, we have some useful ideas by Ruth Heydrich on ways to set up your kitchen and some spices and herbs. One of the big problems that comes up on a vegan diet, anybody can cook vegetables, but then the question is, what do you put on them afterwards? Because it gets really tiresome eating nothing but kale day after day. So we came up with a couple of recipes there. There's a healthy gravy, and there's some low-fat vinaigrette dressing, herb seasonings. I do not write in the in the mode of Eric Lustebader, who gets paid by the word. I, I try to keep the words to a minimum and try to keep the paper output from Kaiser to a minimum, too. And so I have not wasted words here. Everything that's written should have some useful information for you. Well, what's the other really important thing about being healthy? We've, we've touched on diet. What's the other thing that counts at least as much as diet, if not more? Exercise. You all get an A on that. There just is no way of being healthy if you don't exercise. And believe me, there are a zillion different excuses for not exercising, and I've heard a half a zillion of them in 35 years of medical practice. People are very adept at making excuses for exercise. I happen to be one of them myself. I hate exercise, but the alternative is worse. So. I make sure that I get exercise every day, and probably the best way to, to start the day is to do some kind of exercise. It counts as exercise if it makes you sweat, makes you breathe hard, and raises your pulse rate. End of story. You can get uh, caught up in all sorts of all, uh, esoteric types of exercise. You can become Olympic caliber if you want, but the really important thing is that you do it every day, Body strengthening exercises, you see a guy doing abdominal crunches on the bottom of the page there. I think those are pretty important. Just about everybody starts to develop a paunch as they get older, and the best way to deal with a paunch is do abdominal crunches. They work out your rectus abdominis muscles, which run 
vertically right up and down your, the front of your belly. And on the page 10, there's a picture of a guy doing this with his arms. And this is what Charlie Atlas, Charles Atlas, the guy that put a permanent end to kicking sand in people's face. This guy is still in business, believe it or not. I've heard about Charles Atlas in 1935, the first time reading Popular Mechanics. I don't know if Charles is still around, but somebody is hyping his product. And it basically just is a matter of pushing one part of your body against another. For instance, when I, when I do this, I'm working the triceps on this arm against the biceps on this arm. And I will tell you right off that you're not going to start looking like Arnie Schwarzenegger or Charles Atlas by doing this. But if you're so lazy that you can't bring yourself to use a set of weights or go to a gym, you can always do this. And I included these Charles Atlas exercises mostly because they're the perfect answer to anybody who tells me that they don't have the equipment to do weightlifting, they don't have something else that they have to have. All you need are your own muscles. You work your muscles against each other. I suppose that this would be a good place to interject an element that I have not included in this little green pamphlet. This is the subject of ethics. I became a vegetarian for ethical reasons in 1950, not for health reasons. It wasn't until I'd been a vegetarian for about 30 years that I realized that counter to what I had thought, that I was making a huge sacrifice, I had actually done myself a really big favor. So I will probably start putting about three or four sentences about ethics in this little green flyer because health vegetarians cheat like crazy. Health vegetarians find every conceivable reason not to be vegetarian all the time. They'll have a hamburger once a week and they'll say, well, that was just a little bit of a fall off the wagon, won't make any difference, I won't get that much cholesterol. And I eat a little bit of chicken and fish every now and then, and of course that doesn't count either. And pretty soon, you've lost the whole benefit of vegetarian diet. In order to make it work, you've got to stick with it. It makes it very difficult for me as a physician to see patients who are not following the, the vegetarian diet strictly because I really don't know where I'm at. I don't know whether I'm accomplishing anything with their weight or with their cholesterol levels or whatever it is they're trying to accomplish because I'm not sure just how close they're sticking to the diet. If you're already toying with the idea of being a vegetarian for health reasons, you might as well go the whole, whole hog. If you have any question about it, go on down to the, where is it, the slaughterhouse out in Neva Beach? There's, if you can get in. They, but if you ever get a chance to go through a slaughterhouse when they're slaughtering animals, just Take a look and decide whether you really think that's okay. What, what you're watching is okay. I want to discuss the third concern of the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, which is animal rights. I grew up in the middle of the Second World War, which took 36 million human lives, mostly non-combatants, women and children. Although I was too young to be in the war, its brutality and violence affected me profoundly at the same time that it generated a lifelong fascination with flying. Year after I became a vegetarian in 1950, I started flying gliders and anything else it could get in the air. It was about then also that I came to the conclusion that the killing and eating of animals desensitizes people to what otherwise would be a strong and natural revulsion to the killing of humans. Rights arguments fall short for me because this is probably the only thing that Karl Marx ever said that I agree with. I think rights come out of a barrel of a gun. We, we give ourselves rights because it's a way that we have of keeping the barbarians on the other side of the gate. But there aren't any rights in nature. Nature will allow anything to happen. So this is my argument. Mine is the argument that was made by Peter Singer when he spoke to us last month. He's a utilitarian and so am I. In the very first chapter of Genesis, we have this quote, Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth, and every tree that has seed in it. They will be yours for food. I give every green plant for food. And it was so. Now this biblical quote says nothing about dairy, eggs, fish, meat, or poultry. But from the scientific standpoint, the dietary advice comes out the same. Our remote primate ancestors evolved over 56 million years, living in trees where the food supply was mostly fruit, leaves, and nuts. 
and most of our physiology developed on those foods. But about three million years ago, our hominid ancestors descended to the ground and began adding meat to the diet as a survival strategy. Still, all of the essential amino acids, fatty acids, and vitamins in the human diet are synthesized only by plants, not by animals. Of course, Michelangelo shows here that part of the Eden story that says that a serpent conned Adam and Eve into eating the forbidden fruit, which I suspect was unique only in that it had fur on it. But when God found out about that, he showed the happy couple to the door. Modern meat apologists say that God also told them they might as well go ahead and eat animals since they weren't going to follow the rules anyway. But I always ask those folks, where would you rather be, back in the Garden of Eden or here in greater downtown Sodom and Gomorrah? The legend also has it that the snake in that garden was in cahoots with the devil. The devil usually looks like this with red skin, hooves, horns, and a tail. That devil is a persistent image. And I first encountered him back in 1937 while perusing the ads in my mother's chief source of intellectual stimulation, the Ladies' Home Journal. The figure then was much more macho than this one, but 60 years later, the basic logo is the same, the company is the same, and the product is still dead pig. In the interim, the U.S. has been in one war that took 36 million human lives and two more that took two million apiece, all sides included. That does not count the additional 100 million domestic homicides and political assassinations attributed to the 20th century. And lots of other things have happened through the ages to make thoughtful people wonder if there may be some lurking principle of evil that has control of human life. Here from 1412 A.D., a horned, chicken-footed devil directs a plague. In the year 1415 A.D., the Limburg brothers painted this monstrous devil who inhales human flesh. Somewhat apropos, George Bernard Shaw once observed that meat-eating is just cannibalism with the heroic dish omitted. In 1503 A.D., Signorelli gave us winged devils who carried off sinners at the Last Judgment. Here, the mischievous Aubrey Beardsley draws some minor horned demons appreciatively laying Salome to rest after she's arranged for John the Baptist's head to be brought in on a platter. We get devils in children's storybooks, perhaps to frighten the kids into submission. Here is a cloven-hoofed devil from a 19th century Connecticut political campaign. Here is a liquor tax devil. Apparently, U.S. News and World Report thinks that some people still believe that the devil is real. In 1991, they devoted a large article to hell, the devil's home port. But whether or not we think the devil is real, the fact is that huge populations in the past were convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt that he was real, and they chose to personify him more or less like this. Now, there are certain definitions from the wonderful land of psychiatry that occasionally turn out to be useful. Here is one. Projection, the mechanism by which the ego refuses to acknowledge an unacceptable impulse by relocating it onto someone else. Maybe all those medieval theologians with the little red hats and the foofles hanging down the side realized unconsciously that evil comes into the world through the killing of animals but instead of coming right out and telling their parishioners that they should go back to eating the herbs of the field and the fruits of the trees, as their own Bible stated right up front, they invented a devil and projected human evil onto him. As customarily depicted, he's just a man who has killed an animal, smeared himself with its blood, and has put on its hooves, horns, and tail. There's another psychiatric theory that may also apply. It's called cognitive dissonance. If, for instance, you're a smoker, you have cognition one, I smoke. Cognition two, smoking causes cancer. At this point, you have two ways to resolve the dissonance. First, you can stop smoking, and second, you can deny that smoking is a risk. Here's another example. Cognition one, I am a peaceful, innocent child of God. Cognition two, I kill and eat other animals. This cognitive dissonance is dealt with by creating an evil anti-god, the devil, and projecting cognition too onto him. But the primitive mind so often leaves a telltale track by which we can trace its rationalizations. In this case, the devil is a slaughtered cow.
an unconscious admission that evil comes into the world by the killing of other conscious creatures. For in the killing of animals, we introduce a rip in the ethical fabric, and we remove the cornerstone for a coherent ethical structure, and we tear away that strip of ethical insulation, which could make it impossible for us to kill our fellow humans. Now, there is a semantic problem that relates to the words alive and dead. An uprooted cabbage, a beefsteak, and a decapitated infantryman are still all alive, at least until they spoil or get cooked because up until then you can grow their cells in tissue culture. But we usually agree that the steer the steak came from is dead and so is the infantryman because there's a difference in the way we apply those words and that has to do with the presence or absence of a nervous system. The steer and the soldier both have one, the cabbage has none. Here for instance is a schematic drawing of a sheep's brain. It's not much different than what you would find in a steer. And here is the brain of a human. It doesn't look all that much different from that of a steer or a sheep. We know that the human brain supports consciousness. So we have good reason to believe other animals are conscious too. And consciousness, whatever that finally turns out to be, evolved as a mechanism to coordinate the activities of the brain to help central nervous system provide the best possible chance for individual survival. This steer, which has been brought into the killing pen of a slaughterhouse, gives every appearance of knowing that this moment is its last, and it behaves very much the way a human would in the same situation. The steer can't do differential equations or build linear accelerators at Stanford, nor embroider tapestries in Florence, but it is conscious and it fears death and suffers pain just as we do. Vegetarians are sometimes criticized for paying more attention to the welfare of animals than the welfare of humans, but it's precisely because we're concerned with human welfare that we argue against killing animals. Vegetarians think that animal source food has a catastrophic effect not only on human health and the world environment, but also on the ethical fabric of society. Humans, convinced that they have to kill in order to live, become inured to the sight of blood and the thought of killing. Here's one simple example. A 15-year-old kid hauled into court for the rape and murder of a 12-year-old girl. Where did he get the idea? Louis already was inclined to violence when he witnessed a killing firsthand, just a few weeks before he would become a killer. An uncle took the youngster to a pig slaughter, a common procedure here in Vermont farm country. Louis was suspended from school soon after the pig slaughter and began hanging out at the Burlington City dumps. Inspector Robbie Yandel had made his way into the dense woods to find an old foam mattress and beneath it, the missing classmate, Melissa Walbridge. Her hands were bound behind her back, near the small of her back, and a clenched, her hands were in a clenched position. Melissa's body was identified and word quickly spread through the little town. The Walbridges were informed their daughter would not be coming home that boy might have killed the girl anyway, but the folks around him saw nothing wrong with killing the pig, so how was he to construct the buffer zone to homicide that a consensus against killing animals might have provided? After all, it's macho to kill animals. Why isn't it just as macho to kill little girls? The ethical buffer zone that should make humans think twice about killing other humans just isn't there, so the foundation stone for a consistent ethical structure is missing. If society as a whole abhorred the killing of animals, we might think twice before killing each other. But killing animals is just a dress rehearsal for killing humans. Now to get back to the recipe, I think 300 million turkeys buy the farm every year around Thanksgiving and Christmas because as you know, you can't have a festive holiday party without a dead turkey on the plate. So I decided maybe I should try to save the turkeys a little bit and figure out a good substitute. And this is a mock turkey recipe, primary part of this Thanksgiving dinner. The chief ingredients were kale, tofu, and portobello mushrooms, and some other stuff thrown in to make it more or less like a turkey. And then I used a mold to make it come out looking like this. It's quite a pretty decorative centerpiece for your Thanksgiving dinner. I did a nutrient analysis on the mock turkey. First of all, how many people like kale? Well, that's pretty good. How many people know kids who like kale? <laughs> Different story. 
your kids will never know that there's kale in this because instead of turning out looking green, it turns out looking brown and dead, which is just this kind of stuff that kids will eat. And it looks pretty much like a turkey, except that it's instead of having legs and a neck sticking out, it's kind of got a fluted decorative appearance. The mock turkey is over 167% of the RDA for everything. Its lowest nutrient was calcium was 167% of 800 milligrams, and everything else was astronomically higher than that. By contrast, if you were to eat a real whole turkey, you'd average out about 43% of calories from fat. You would get 342% of the upper limit RDA for cholesterol. That'd be about 1,100 milligrams of cholesterol. I don't know many people that have ever eaten a whole turkey, but nevertheless, there's lots of cholesterol in that, just as there is a lot of cholesterol in chicken and fish. It only had 35% of the RDA for calcium, and uh, if you pick up a copy of the recipe on the way out, you'll... this is called a bunt pan. It's an aluminum molded pan that's got a non-stick surface. I don't feel very happy about cooking in aluminum, but I think this is probably okay if you only use it once or twice a year because the surface peels the food from the aluminum. Exhibit number one is a plate of kale. The kale is the highest nutrient indices of any food you can find. It's got lots of calcium, lots of protein, lots of various vitamins. The only problem is that it's green. If you, you serve this up at Thanksgiving, your kids won't eat it. So we've got to find a way to make it look like it's something other than kale. If you had green and red, you wind up with something that looks brown and dead. This is a plain old beetroot. Doesn't have any particular good nutrient value. Certainly nothing like the kale. The kale is loaded, but the beets will offset the green color. So we're going to take this bunt pan here now. I'm going to pour this mixture into the bunt pan. Green glop into the pan. Now remember, there's nothing in there that came from an animal, regardless of its appearance. It's all vegetable, and that's what it looks like in the pan. And that's all there is to it. And take the wood pan into the oven. The ingredients are love stuffing mix, or any prepared stuffing mix, which comes with spices some celery, Maui onions, water chestnuts for some crunch, mushrooms, and a variety of spices, thyme, sage, and poultry seasoning, and salt and pepper. I doubled the recipe for the mock turkey loaf, and here's what it looks like after baking it and inverting it out of the bunt pan onto a plate. As I said before, it's a complete and nutritious food. The stuffing tastes pretty much like any other stuffing and has about the same nutritional value, which is to say, not much. The squash is pretty healthy food, but has multiple nutrient deficiencies. Mushroom gravy tastes great, but it's short on protein, vitamins B1, B2, B12, E, and zinc. You know that pumpkin pie is going to be lacking Boku nutrients, and so is the topping because of the high sugar content in the form of maple syrup. So the star of the show is really the mock turkey loaf that had everything because of a careful selection of leafy greens, tofu, mushrooms, and red star yeast. Here's the whole vegan Thanksgiving setup minus the cranberry sauce, which incidentally turned out to go very well with the mock turkey loaf. Well, that is my little contribution to the turkeys of the world. I think it's time for questions. Question back there. As you age, you tend to dry out. 
And how do you get around the fact that in this, these recipes there is no oil? That's a good question. I'm glad you asked it. There is no RDA for oil in the diet. There has never been, there never will be. There is an RDA for two essential fatty acids. The two essential fatty acids are linoleic acid, which is the first of the omega-6 fatty acids, and alpha-linolenic acid, which is the first of the omega-3 fatty acids. You can make all of the other fats that you need from those two essential fatty acids. As far as drying out, my recommendation, particularly in Hawaii, is that everybody drink about eight glasses of water every day. I used to think that that was sort of schlockery, but I think it does make a difference. We've got a hot climate. You do tend to dry out because it's warm here, and it's not a bad idea to start off in the morning drinking four glasses of water, and then maybe an hour later you have a couple more. Before you know it, the last two glasses of water have gone down the gullet, and you've hardly even noticed it. By doing that, you've more or less protected yourself against kidney stones. This is the kidney stone capital of the world, I'll tell you that, as an emergency room physician. I've seen more kidney stones here than any place else I've ever practiced. They ain't fun. They're not life-threatening, but they're not fun. We tend to get dried out in this hot climate, so drink a lot of water. I'm sure that I haven't entirely satisfied your question about oil, but consider this. Oil was never a part of the pre-agricultural diet. Up until about 4,500 years ago, humans did not use oil in any form. It was not until about 2,500 BC that the Egyptians started using oil to paint. They used linseed oil as paint. That was a pretty good choice. If you're going to use oil, linseed oil is the same as flaxseed oil. And if you're going to use any kind of oil, flaxseed oil is the stuff to use because it's very high in alpha-linolenic acid. Eva, you had a question. The flaxseed oil should not be heated. I agree, you shouldn't heat up oil. If you do use oil, at least don't cook with it because the oil gets denatured, oxidized, and you get all kinds of weird chemical compounds that don't have any place in human nutrition. I'll tell you another type of oil to particularly avoid, and it's one that you can scarcely avoid if you buy any packaged food industry products, and that's hydrogenated oil. Hydrogenated oil starts off as relatively benign soybean oil or safflower oil, and they heat it up in the presence of a nickel catalyst, and by the time they're finished doing all of this, you have an abnormal type of fatty acid called a trans fatty acid, which has a configuration which is not present in your own body. Your own body makes cis fatty acids. These are stereo, what, what are called stereoisomers, cis and trans. And biologically, we make cis fatty acids. We do not make trans fatty acids. We don't have any use for the trans fatty acids. When we eat them as a result of taking in the hydrogenated oil, two things happen. First of all, the trans fatty acids act like saturated fats and they raise your cholesterol level. And secondly, the trans fats can get into your cell membranes. And nobody has studied trans fatty acids in your cell membranes, but I will give you my own personal take on this, and that is that trans fatty acids damage the integrity of the cell membrane and predispose to certain viral infections Shortly after the Egyptians started using linseed oil, they started using olive oil too. So olive oil has been around for, well, 4,500, maybe 5,500 years, and nobody has ever pinned the wrap on olive oil. And I cannot say that that's really bad stuff, and I use a little bit of it myself, but it's a question of <laughs> do not do as I do, do as I say. Olive oil is not bad. And you had a question about nuts. I think nuts are fine. I'm not an advisor of the super low-fat vegan diet. If you're not overweight, I think it's perfectly okay to eat raw nuts and avocados and other natural plant fats. There's some literature that now shows that avocados, raw avocados and raw almonds and raw walnuts actually lower cholesterol in spite of the fact that these are really high-fat plant foods. They were probably 80% of calories from fat. It's a little bit paradoxical, 
Probably half the patients that I get are overweight. Some of them are seriously overweight. They're up in the three to 400 pound range and they need to get weight down in a big hurry. And I explain to them that if they follow this, this vegan diet, they're gonna be able to eat as much as they want. They don't have to limit the amount of food they eat. As long as they're eating relatively low fat plant foods, they're always going to meet their nutrient requirements. They'll meet the RDAs for all the nutrients and they will fill their stomachs because plant foods are very bulky, as you know, and they'll, they'll be short on calories. So they've filled their stomach, they've met all of their nutrient RDAs, and they're short on calories, so they have to mobilize their fat stores, and that's why on a whole food vegan diet, you can lose about a pound a week. Now there are fancy diets like the Atkins diet where you can drop four or five pounds a week, but the diet is not sustainable. It's probably gonna have injurious effects to your other, other organs. There's a very good chance that when you come off that diet, you'll blimp right back up. Your body interprets crash diets as a famine, and it resets your apostat so that when you come off the, the crash diet and you've lost 50 pounds, your body thinks, well, you've just gone through a famine, so let's, let's make sure that you got enough fat around the next time we have a famine so there won't be any danger of your dying, so you wind up 10 pounds heavier than you were. On a vegan diet, you'll drop a pound a week, and that's 52 pounds a year. It's 104 pounds in two years. That should be satisfactory for anyone. If the patient gets the fat fits after about three weeks on this really low-fat vegan diet, eating nothing but grass and hay and dandelions and, and weed clippings, and they're losing weight successfully, I'll tell them, well, look, experiment with the raw nuts. They're not going to hurt you. Experiment with the avocados. They'll give you that fat sense that you want. They will probably help lower your blood lipids, which is almost always one of the objectives that I'm after when I'm dealing with an overweight patient. As long as you can continue to lose weight and be comfortable eating the food that you're eating, that's fine. I don't want my patients to feel that they're being deprived, that, that they have made some huge sacrifice in their lives and that life is going to be miserable. And I want them to, to enjoy the food they're eating. And as long as they can lose weight successfully, I don't care if they eat natural plant fats. I do advise them not to use the oils, though, because oils are 100% fat. Let's have another question. You cannot believe the words vitamin B12 unless somewhere on the label it also says cobalamin. Vitamin B12 is a really complicated molecule. We could spend the rest of the evening talking about this molecule. It's bigger than any other vitamin. It's more complicated than any other vitamin. And there are B12 analogs which look like vitamin B12 but which do not behave like B12 and in fact may be antagonistic to the real vitamin B12. There is a part of the B12 molecule called cobalamin, and if that part is not there, you're not dealing with real vitamin B12. I don't want to play Russian roulette, and I'm going to stick with things that I know to have the real cobalamin. There's the only two things I know of. Number one, a vitamin B12 supplement, and you only need about 25 micrograms a week your daily RDA for B12 is only one to two micrograms. That's a thousandth of a milligram and a millionth of a gram. So it's a really tiny amount. The pill is one way to get your B12, and the other way to get it is the Red Star T6635 plus nutritional yeast. And I don't own stock in the company, but I've contacted them. Yeast doesn't manufacture B12 either but they add cobalamin that has been made for them by the Rhone Polenc Pharmaceutical Company in France. So it's legitimate B12 and it's, there's an adequate amount of it. And incidentally, yeast tastes pretty good. That Where can you get the Red Star yeast? Well, down to earth has got it. I think probably most of the health food stores in town have got it. They're remarkably bashful about admitting that they've got it. You have to almost take a detective along to find it. Stashed away in the 
of the bulk food section with a very diminutive label that says Red Start T6635. And they ought to put it in a bag, label, hey, this is the real thing, this is B12, and then everybody would know, but they don't seem to get the message. Health breakfasts have cobalamin added. Now, you sure it's cobalamin, it's not vitamin B12? They actually say cobalamin. Okay, that's probably legit. Question? Festivals that we call Thanksgiving and Christmas are deadly occasions for your health. You're going to go to the, your friends' places, they're going to be eating grease, deep fried, and hot fat, and you're going to wind up eating it because it's rude not to do so, right? And you got to give what the hostess has to prepare. So I think that probably the fact that we have this health disaster that goes on every winter may have something to do with the fact that we are consuming this really super rich food at Thanksgiving. We're doing it again at Christmas. We're doing it again at New Year's. And our health does not really seem to be getting back to normal until slightly after the Easter ham disappears in the spring. <laughs> Another question? Question. So, uh, there, is there research documenting significant difference between organic and non-organic foods. Yeah, I think there probably is, but I don't know where to get it. The organic advocates say that there is just no comparison. The non-organic people will often say, well, hey, look, our stuff is, has got richer nutrient value than the organic. And in principle, we should try to support the organic growers as much as possible because the alternative is to become more heavily dependent on a chemical industry which is already running amok in Congress. We should support the organic growers simply because they're, they're putting up a fight against the chemical industry which has just got an incredible amount of clout in Congress. We ought to fight them for no other reason than the fact that they've got too much power. There was another question back there. Flaxseed in fruit? I don't see anything wrong. You use the seed as it is. You don't grind it up first. You may be ahead of me. I put about a teaspoon of flaxseed oil in my smoothie every day, but your conglopsin may be better than mine. The flaxseed has by far the highest content of alpha linolenic acid, the first of the omega-3 fatty acids, and it is very important that you get enough of that stuff, and it's very difficult to get enough of it because Ever since the agricultural revolution 10,000 years ago, which was based on grain, we've been on the shorts for alpha linolenic acid. And the reason is that grains are high in linoleic acid, but they've got pitiful small amounts of alpha linolenic acid. And you need the alpha linolenic acid, well, among other things, to create DHA, which is an elongated omega-3 fatty acid, which is a major player in the central nervous system. The brain has a lot of DHA in it, and because of our dependence on grains, we're not getting enough alpha linolenic acids. And I think probably that's affecting our, the leadership of our government. <laughs> <laughs> we need to ship them all several gallons of flaxseed oil. The question is, can I paraphrase it? Should you combine foods? Should you go on for combining foods? Okay, the natural hygienists are the, the, the people who insist that all food should be combined in thus and such way. You should never eat fruits with protein. You should never do this. You never, it turns, you know, it's hard enough being a vegan without going, going to the, the extreme of combining foods. Now, I would personally find it very offensive to drink orange juice and eat a potato at the same time. I think there's some disastrous combinations for me personally, but I'm not going to tell you that you can't do it. You may find that well, you may have all kinds of weird combinations that work out perfectly well. What we're getting into now and in talking about food combining is what we refer to as fine-tuning. Now, I'm not interested in fine-tuning you. I'm interested in getting you off the food that is almost certainly going to have disastrously bad side effects, and that's animal food. Fish and fish oil, you're talking about EPA and DHA. EPA is an elongated omega-3 fatty acid. The reason fish have a lot of it 
is because the bottom line in the marine food chain is algae. Algae manufacture alpha linolenic acid. As a matter of fact, alpha linolenic acid is only synthesized in the chloroplasts of green plants. Chloroplasts are little organelle that's inside every cell. So the fish start off with the algae, then a bigger fish comes along and eats that fish, gets a lot of the original alpha linolenic acid, plus some of the EPA and the DHA that that fish made. And by the time you get up to the size of fish that humans eat, you've got pretty sizable concentrations of EPA and DHA. EPA thins out your blood and it reduces your chance of ha having a heart attack, but it's a two-edged sword because EPA increases the risk of a stroke. So when you use, use fish oil, and I have a chapter in my book here called Fish Oil Flim Flam. When you eat fish oil, you reduce your chance of a heart attack, but you increase your risk of stroke. And you don't need to use the fish oil because you can make both EPA and DHA yourself if you're getting enough of the alpha linolenic acid, one of the two essential fatty acids that I mentioned. Well, I am reminded of the professor <clears throat> who dreamt that he was giving a lecture, and when he woke up, he found that he was. And so I think I'll, I'll cut it right here. If anybody has questions afterwards, why uh, go to it. Carl, you want to wind this up? You've seen the Dr. Bill show. It includes these lights over here. It includes telling me what to say. <laughs> it includes giving a lecture and answering the questions. So please hang around. Please talk to some of us. Please have some iced tea. And thank you for coming. This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Free monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and healthful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944-8344. That's 944-8344, or visit our website at www.vsh.org, vsh.org.